John Leckie is one of Britain's most acclaimed rock producers. He has produced and engineered music by Muse, The Stone Roses, Radiohead, Pink Floyd and many many more. An invited audience of 80 record producers gathered at Abbey Road Studios where George Schilling sat down with John to chat about the studios and his amazing career there. Where's your shoes? You're fired. <laughs> I've just got a, D, a D19C. If I put it over the drummer, will it sound like Ringo? And you said no, it sounds sh- <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Jane Howard, that's me, with the help of Tape Community Music and Film, have brought the conversation to life through my animations. Um, so, what was the question? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So that that was often like you'd you'd go up to Vera's room and she'd put you on a week or two weeks, nine to half past five of solo violin or something or some German woman singing or something for every day for two weeks. You'd do that. And then next day you'd spend all weekend staying up all night with Pink Floyd or Edgar Broughton band or something, you know. So, yeah, you'd do anything, really, uh, which was great learning. Uh, experience so you could record big orchestras you could record rock and roll bands and you could record um, Danny LaRue if mm-hmm. anyone knows who Danny LaRue is they're <laughs> off to the session yeah. anyway. obviously Lester's t- told us all about the microphone collection here and um, you, you obviously got to see people using them and, and then sort of learn what they sounded like presumably from, yeah. from observing what mics people would use on different instruments yeah yeah, yeah, of course. Unlike, yeah. you know, and also we were saying earlier about how um, people sort of kept their secret sort of techniques, yeah. you know, whereas now we're telling everybody how you did it. That's so right. You, you wouldn't sort of share the information quite the same way in those days. No, no, it was kind of considered top secret, really. I yeah. mean, it sounds a bit funny now, but I remember when I first started doing interviews for magazines and stuff, and they kind of go, what microphones do you use on the drums? And I'd say... I'm not telling you that. You know, that's my trade secret. You know, you don't, you don't really share people. You know, that, that's your trade secret. Your special, yeah. special little this secret weapon that you would get out. You know, I mean, I know it sounds mad, but things like putting the vocal through the Leslie. I know bloody Jeff Emmerich did it with Tomorrow Never Knows, but I didn't know that. I didn't know that's how they got the vocal sound. No. It was just a trick that I knew that at the back of a Hammond C3 there was a phono socket and if you got a XLR to phono and plugged the mic in and plugged it into this phono socket you could your voice came out the Leslie which was fantastic yeah you know and only you didn't tell anyone else that <laughs> <laughs> that was your trick well, I think yeah. even you know even 20 or 30 years after that it was still people were still quite secretive about things and yeah you know and I've experienced I was telling you about you know yeah. a famous engineer who I went to have a look at the mixing desk and I was looking to see what all the knobs did and he peeled off the, the strip. Yeah, he thought so I was he, looking at what his EQs were. What his EQs were, yeah. <laughs> As if that was going to help me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Yeah. But there are no secrets, are there now? No, not really, no. But no, then... But you, it never comes out the same. There's no good point in saying, this is the mic I use, I always use a D20 and on a bass drum. But it doesn't mean to say you're going to get a John Leckie bass drum sound just because no. you're using that mic or even reverbs or something. You know, mm. it's all a bit irrelevant, really. Absolutely. I think when I first time I interviewed you or second time I interviewed you, I think I, think I must have interviewed you about six times now. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think I said, you know, I've, I've just got a, D, a D19C. If I put it over the drummer, will it sound like Ringo? And you said, no, it will sound shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because it's yeah. a crap mic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you always see those photos of Ringo in here, don't you, with, with the, the D19C hanging over his head. Yeah. I don't know if you ever see a picture of the Beatles in Abbey Road. That's yeah. That was what I used. That's right, yeah. It sounds pretty good on the records. Well, it's because it's a robust moving yeah. core mic. And, yeah. You know, I mean, Lester said about dropping the D19, but um, they were, they're a robust, ro- yeah. like a 58, really. I yeah. mean, you can throw it on the floor and swing it around and bash mm. it, and it's still going to work. <laughs> you can't do that with... You can't do that... Well, you can do it with a 58 or a 57. You can, you know, like Roger Daltrey, you can do that. But you wouldn't do it with an 87 or a 47, would you? <laughs> yeah. It'd be after your blood if you did. I know. <laughs>
<laughs> so you, I gather, your some a lot of your early sessions were actually in this room or in Studio Three. That's right. Yeah, we were going to talk about three the way it used to be. Well, so that have been, cause you, did you do some sessions with Mickey Most as well? Were you, were you, yeah, yeah. Would yeah. yeah. well, that have been in here? Yeah, usually in here, yeah. What was, that, what was, was he like then? What was... Mickey Mouse was fantastic, actually. I learned a lot. The thing I learned about from Mickey was about the song, really. Forget about the engineering mm. and the sound and all that shit. It's about the song and the vocal and the mix. Mm. He was fussy about the mix, but mm. he'd bash it down. I mean, we're talking eight track and doing four songs in three hours with a 20 minute Musicians Union tea break. And you've got to be ready to record at 10. And the drummer doesn't show up till five to ten. So, you know, at five to ten, the studio's empty. Session's going to start at ten. And three minutes to ten, everyone comes in. Right, we're ready. <laughs> and you're late. <laughs> so you've got to be ready too, you know. And you learn how to do that. That's where your job is. And you don't fuck up or else you don't get them. You get fired or they don't ask you to do it again. And it's also a challenge, you know, to, to record 24 musicians mm. on eight track in four songs in three hours and next week it's top of the pops literally next week mm. Susie Quattro boom it's, it's number one you know so uh, you know there wasn't a lot of faffing about with computers and mixing and all tuning and all that stuff you just got great musicians and great vibe and did it all in here so yeah this room this room this area was quite different this room wasn't even here I mean I don't know how many people know about this but this, the the control room the whole studio was round the other way the control room that booth at the back was actually it goes back further than that and that was the control room and the to get in the control room it was a door off of the reception so the only way to get from the control room to the studio was to walk past the front door all the Beatles fans at the front past the commissionaire who was the security guy and come in this side door so you know, every time there was a playback, the band would have to walk all the way around and have to play back and then walk all the way back again. Um, the studio was quite dead. It was. It was all acoustic tiles, <laughs> uh, low ceiling, acoustic tile, low ceiling. Um, and the interesting thing about that control room, of course, is it's the only room in Abbey Road that's got daylight. So the, the windows, if you go in that booth and just look, you'll see a little bit of a window and the, it's got an old frame, small window frame, because from the outside of the pier, that when they built this room, they couldn't change the outside appearance of the building, so the window frame's the same. But you've got to remember the Beatles sat in there, and their only access to the outside world was looking out of that window of people going over the crossing. So maybe that's how they got the idea of them on the crossing, was because that's what they looked at all the time when they were in this studio. Um, and this studio, this this room, so the studio ended probably right where we're sitting, I think. And this room uh, was not really used. The only thing that was, there was always access to that door. And there used to be the sound effects cupboard. So the guy called Stuart Eltham, he, he had the sound effects. His, his little thing was going out and recording trains going past. And there was always a sound effects library, but a lot of it was in mono and studio and Stuart and Alan Parsons as well doing money. So Alan, the, 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 the money loop on money was Alan recording t uh, clocks ticking for the sound effects covered, you know? Um, but you basically had a, <laughs> let's just laugh in. You remember you said the sound effects covered here. So very often, you know, you'll be doing a, a, an album and you go, Hey, it'd be great to have the sound of seagulls, wouldn't it? So you rush off to Stuart's, sound effects covered and get this, this things out. Um, you know, and a beat, of course, Sergeant Pepper's full of um, Abbey Road sound effects from that cupboard. Um. Yeah. Was that all right, Mike? That was fantastic. That's brilliant. Is that the sort of thing you wanted? <laughs>